الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلي على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الهداة المهديين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى يوم الدين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Ever since Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam died, the Shia of Ahlul Bayt for 250 years after Rasulullah, they were used to having the Imams of Ahlul Bayt at their presence and benefiting from their guidance. So if anyone had a question from the Imam, the Imam was accessible. They could access the Imam, they could discuss their religious affairs with the Imam, they could ask the Imams about any matters of faith about the verses of the Holy Qur'an, about the laws of halal and haram, fiqh, jurisprudence, they could go and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the imam, speak to the imam, meet the imam. They could ask them about their aqidah, about their beliefs. They could ask them about personal matters and they could request the help and guidance of the imam in their personal life, whether it's financial problems that they have, whether it's social problems, family problems, with their wife and husband, children, with a partner, with a brother, with another family member, with a neighbor. They could access the Imam and the Imams were there to help them for this 250 year period after Rasulullah. In addition to that, many of the companions of the Imams, they had the honor of studying at the hands of the Imams. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, they had a hawza, a seminary, thousands of students would study there. What an honor it is that Imam al-Sadiq is my direct teacher. I would go every day, sit in class, the Imam would give a hadith and he would teach me fiqh and aqidah. So many of the Shia, they had this honor being this close to Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al-Baqir and the other Imams. And nonetheless, at least during this 250 year period, at least the Shia, they could just go and sit and see the Imam. They could be at his presence. Do you know what an honor it is just to look at the beautiful shining face, illuminating face of the Imam? Do you know what an effect that has on my heart and on my soul and on my spirit? Sometimes we go and we see our maraja in Najaf and Qom. We see them, I, I, I hear some brothers, they say for weeks that this leaves a mark on my soul. I feel I'm closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm more humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I receive a God conscious state just because I see this marja. And remember this marja is what? Is only a servant of the Imam, of the 12th Imam, of the Imam of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. So how great would it be to see the Imams themselves? They had this honor. This was from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's time all the, ta all the way to the time of Imam al-Askari, 250 years. <clears throat> all of a sudden, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam dies, passes away, and the 12th Imam is Imam al-Mahdi, he's the successor. But all of a sudden everything changes because Imam al-Mahdi is no longer available. The Imam al-Mahdi is no longer at the disposal of the Shia, he's not there for them to meet him. They can no longer meet him, they can no longer speak to him, they can no longer see him. Do you know how difficult this was for the Shia? For 250 years, we're so used to going to the Imam. Yes, maybe at times it was difficult. Imam Al-Kalim was in prison a few years, but that was only a few years. Maybe when the later Imams, Imam Al-Hadi, Imam Al-Askari, when Samara, it was more difficult to go there. But if you made that extra effort, you could still go and see him. Right now, it's impossible. I can no longer see the Imam. This was a very difficult time for the Shia of Ahlul Bayt because their Imam was away from them. And the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, Rasulullah, Imam Ali, all the Imams, they knew of this time. And they knew this will come the day that the Imam, Imam Al Mahdi will come. He'll go into Ghaybah. And they knew this will be a very difficult time for the Shia. And that's why they had to prepare the Shia for that time. They were aware of this. And they took many steps in order to prepare the Shia for the Ghaybah. So that when that time comes, the Shia aren't stunned and shocked and alarmed. What is this Ghaybah? What's this concept of Ghaybah? The Imams and Rasulullah. You see how it started from the time of Rasulullah. He wanted to prepare the Shia for the time of the Ghaybah of the 12th Imam. 
So what did the Imams do to prepare the Shia? Four things. The four things Rasulullah and the Imams did in order to prepare the Shia for this critical time, al ghaybah that we live in today. Number one, the first things Rasulullah and the Imams did, they prepared the Shia for the concept of al ghaybah psychologically. Like I said, 250 years, 250 years, the Imam is there, he's present. All of a sudden, my Imam, the 12th Imam, is my Imam, he's alive, but he's in a state of ghaybah, occultation, what is this? So this concept, the Imams, they concentrated on. They made sure that, look, one day, when one of the Imams will come and go into the ghaybah, don't be alarmed, this is normal. Many, ulam, many prophets before Islam, they went into ghaybah, so this is not something unusual. You might ask, why did the Imam go into Ghaybah? I will tell you for this and this reason. What's the purpose of an Imam in Ghaybah? Such and such reasons. So they prepared them psychologically. Do not disbelieve in the Imam just because he's in a state of Ghaybah. We have a hadith from Rasulullah speaking about the Ghaybah of Imam Mahdi. And he tells his companions, if you hear that the Imam goes into Ghaybah, do not disbelieve in him just because he is in a state of Ghaybah, just because he's in occultation. And go back and read the book of Bihar al-Anwar. Bihar al-Anwar has a chapter, two or three volumes, all on Imam al-Mahdi, a hadith of Imam al-Mahdi. In one area of it, he mentions the ahadith of Rasulullah and the Imams about the ghaybah of Imam Mahdi. So he mentions five, six, ten ahadith from Rasulullah. Rasulullah, on all these ahadith, he's telling his ashab of the ghaybah of Imam al-Mahdi. So that what? So that they're ready. So it's not a new notion to them. Likewise, the Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he tells his companions, one of my descendants, one of my children, he will go into state of ghaybah. Do not disbelieve in him. Imam, al, for example, Hassan, Imam al Hussein, Imam Zain al Abideen, all the way to Imam Askari. They all spoke of the ghaybah of Imam Mahdi. So all of a sudden, the Shia don't wake up one day and they say, your Imam is in ghaybah. No, you knew about this. Ever since the time of Rasulullah, this was made clear. The 12th Imam or one of the Imams, he will go in a state of ghaybah. Do not disbelieve in him and say this is not true just because he's in a state of ghaybah. Because the Imams and Rasulullah, they informed of this. So this was number one, the first thing they did. They prepared the Shia psychologically for the state of ghaybah. Number two, the second thing Rasulullah and the Imams did is that this began during the time of Imam al-Baqir, the fifth Imam. They began to appoint representatives on their behalf. They told their Shia, look, if you cannot access us because your house is far, I live in Medina, you live in another city, and it's difficult to travel back then, there's no TV, there's no telephone, there's no social media, so if you have a question of the Imam, you can't just WhatsApp him, you can't call his office, you have to what? You have to make a one month trip if you live in a different country just to ask the Imam a question. So the Imams, they told their Shia, if you cannot access us, it's difficult, you're sick, or maybe the Imam is sick, it's difficult for him to answer the questions, or maybe there is a state of taqiyya, fear, then we will appoint representatives, wukala. Go to the wakil, you ask them your questions, you give them the khumus, you do whatever you want, they represent us. And this began during the time of Imam al-Baqir. Why did they do this? Not only to help the Shia during their time, but to prepare the Shia for the time of the ghaybah. They want to tell the Shia of the ghaybah, look, you can't access the Imam because he's in a state of ghaybah. Then you access the representatives of the Imam. Imam al-Mahdi Allah Faraj al-Sharif, during ghaybah al sughra he had specific ambassadors and wukala that we'll speak about in a few minutes and in ghaybat al-kubra that we live in today he has general ambassadors and general wukala and that we'll speak about tomorrow inshallah so just because you cannot access the imam doesn't mean you have no way no you have representatives they wanted the shia to get used to the fact that if the imam is not accessible go to the wakil go to whom go to the the uh, representative and these representatives during the lives of the Imams, they were like maraja. They would give fatwa, they would collect khumus, they would help the people, just like our maraja today. There are some ignorant people, my brothers and sisters, today in communities, they will tell you this idea of marja'iyah, Shia made, this is all innovation, bid'ah. This was never there. Now the problem is these people that claim such a thing, they are ignorant. They haven't read the history of the Imam. What do you mean this is something new? Read the history of Imam Baqir, Imam Sadiq, Imam al rida Imam Al-Hadi, Imam... there's all wukala. There are people that the Imams set them as maraja. You give fatwa, you take khums, you help, just like the Imam. And I'll give you a few examples. Imam Al-Baqir alayhi salam, one of his companions, this is a hadith, by the name of Aban ibn Taghlib. Aban ibn Taghlib was very close to Imam Al-Baqir and Imam Al-Sadiq, that when he died, 
Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he said, when news of the death of Aban reached Imam Sadiq, he said, لَقَدْ أَوْجَعَ قَلْبِي مَوْتُ Aban." That Aban was so dear to Imam Sadiq that the Imam says, my heart has broken because Aban has died. See how great he was? Aban wasn't just great, he was a alim. He was a mushtahid, he was a scholar, he had attended all the classes and taken notes. Imam al-Baqir tells Aban one day, Ya Aban, ijlus fi masjid al-Madina wa afti nas He tells him, sit in the masjid of Rasulullah in Medina. Why? Because back then, the masjid of Rasulullah in Medina was like a hausa. It was like a university. In every corner, you'd see a teacher with a student. Here, there, over there. And if you have come, if you've came to Iran and Qom, if you go and visit Sayyidah Ma'suma alayhi salam, you'll see the same thing in the mornings. You'll see, you know, it's like a classroom. It's a huge classroom, but small different circles. If you go to Najaf, same thing, Karbala, same thing. So the Masjid of Rasulullah was filled with classes. Every sect, every school of thought had a teacher there teaching. Imam al-Sadiq tells Aban, I want you to go and sit with all the other ones, with the, for example, Khawarij, I want you with the Zaydiyas, with the Sunnis, with whoever. You also give fatwa. He uses the word afti. Give fatwa to the people. This is the Imam is alive. And then he tells him, وَإِنِّي أَحِبْ أَنْ يُرَى أَحِبْ وَأَنْ يُرَى فِي شِيعَةِ مثلك. He says, I would love that there are more people like you amongst my Shia, who are knowledgeable, educated, and can give fatwa to the, to the people. So this is number one. This is Imam al-Baqir. Number two, Imam al-Sadiq. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, one day, one of his companions, Abdullah ibn Abi Ya'fur, he comes to him. He tells him, my house is far. I live in a different city. I can't always come and ask you. Sometimes people ask me questions and I don't know the answer. What do I do? What's the solution? Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he tells him, ma yamna'uka min Muhammad ibn Abi Muslim al-Thaqafi. He tells him, there is one of my companions by the name of Muhammad ibn Abi, Muhammad ibn Muslim. Ma yamna'uka min Muhammad ibn Muslim al-Thaqafi. Muhammad ibn Muslim was like Aban. He was a scholar, a alim. He tells him, go to Muhammad ibn Muslim and ask him, and he will give you the fatwas. And another situation, another incident, a man asks Imam al-Sadiq, I can't come to you, who do I ask? He tells him, go to Abu Basir al-Asadi. And a third incident, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he tells one of his companions, his name was Ma'ad ibn Muslim, he tells him, Afti nas give people fatwas. So the Imams, they spread this what? They spread this belief, or they spread this practice, that once you, are, you have studied in our hawza, once you have enough knowledge, you can go and you can give fatwas based on the teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, which is exactly what our maraji do today. They take the hadith of Ahlul Bayt, their understanding, they give fatwa to the people. This is Imam al-Sadiq, and then Imam al-Rada alayhi salam, Imam Rada, there's a hadith from Ali ibn Musayyib. He lived in the city of Qom. Imam Rada is where in Medina, and then he went to Khurasan. So it's far between Qom, Medina, and Khurasan. So he tells him that I can't always come and ask you, who do I go to? He tells him in Qom, there's a big scholar. Who is it? He tells him Ali. He tells him Zakariya ibn Adam. Alayka khudmin Zakariya ibn Adam al ma'moon ala dini wa dunya. Zakariya ibn Adam lived in Qom. He tells him, you can trust him with your faith and with your dunya. Because he was a scholar. Go to him, he's like the merger of your city. And now Zakariya ibn Adam, he has a shrine in the city of Qom. So he went to him. In another hadith, Imam al-Rada alayhi salam, he tells, his, he tells his companions to go to another person, Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman. He tells them, if you can't access me, go to him. So the Imams, they spread this custom across the globe, across the Shia countries, that if you can't access me, go to the Wakil. And likewise, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam. Ahmad ibn Ishaq, who we spoke about, was a big alim himself. He tells him, sometimes I cannot access you. Who do I go to? He tells him, go to Al-Amri, Uthman ibn Sa'id Al-Amri, who was the first ambassador of the 12th Imam. He tells him, Al-Amri, you thiqati, fama adda ilayka anni, fa'adni yu addi, wa ma yaqulu lak, fa'anni yaqul. Anything you want from me, go to Al-Amri. Maybe Al-Amri is accessible, but I am not accessible. So go to Al-Amri. So this is the second thing the Imams did. Wukala. So that once Imam Mahdi Sharif goes into the state of Ghayba, they can we can go back to the Wukala, the representative of the Imam. This is number two. Number three, the third thing they did, the Imams began to spread the ulum of Ahlul Bayt, the ulum of Rasulullah through a hadith. Remember we said Imam al Sadiq al Baqir, they had like a hawza. Thousands of students, the Imams through these students, they spread thousands of ahadiths about anything. About salah, about khumus, about zakat, about hajj, about aqidah, about the day of judgment, about death, about Allah, about Rasulullah. Anything you can imagine, 
thousands of ahadith, these students would all write them down, and then they would compile it into a book. That during the time of Imam al rada there were up to 400 books filled with ahadith from Ahlul Bayt, from Imam Baqir, Sadiq, Ka'dum Rada, these four Imams. And these books were called Al Kutub Al Arba'a Mi'a. 400 books filled. They would probably, if you compile them now, they would be 200 volumes filled with ahadith. Why did the Imams do that? So that once the Imam Al Mahdi goes into the state of Ghaybah, you can go back to the hadith of Imam Al Baqir and Sadiq and Kadhim and Rida. You don't have to necessarily directly ask when the Imam has given us the fatwa, the answer Imam Al Baqir has given us, and it's all there, it's written in books. Then we can go back to them. And those many of those ahadith are available now. And what they call Al-Kutub Al-Arba'a, the book of Al-Kafi, the book of Al-Tahdeeb, Al-Istibsar, Al-Man La Yahdharu Al-Faqih, and other books, they're all available, we can go back to them. So we cannot say, where do we go? There's no knowledge, how do we, uh, how do we know how to pray? No, Imam Al-Baqir, Imam Al-Sadiq, their ahadith are available with us today. This is number three. And finally, the fourth thing that Ahlul Bayt did to prepare the Shia for this new event and phenomenon called Al-Ghaybah, was that the ghayba as we know it today did not happen swiftly. Some people think all of a sudden Imam Askari died and this ghayba began. No, we have two ghaybas. We have the small ghayba, al ghayba al sughra you've heard of it. And then we have al ghayba al kubra the big ghayba, the major ghayba that we live in today. The small ghayba preceded the big ghayba. Why did it precede the big ghayba? Because during the small ghayba, al ghayba al sughra the Shia had some type of access to the Imam. How? Not directly, indirectly. The Imams appointed four ambassadors. You want to reach the Imam? Go through the ambassador. Write him a letter, he'll answer you. The Imam will directly answer you. But this was only for what? 70 years. Ghaybat al-Sughra. So this prepares them for the full occultation, the full ghaybah, that there is absolutely no ambassador, direct specific ambassador to Imam al-Mahdi. So tonight, inshallah, we'll speak about the first ghayba, and tomorrow we'll speak about the second ghayba. Al ghayba al sughra. When did al ghayba al sughra exactly begin? Al ghayba al sughra. There's two opinions between the ulama. The first and major opinion that most believe is that al ghayba al sughra began when Imam al Askari died. Imam al Mahdi, remember we mentioned yesterday that after Imam Askari died, Imam Mahdi came and he prayed on his father and he told his uncle Ja'far, move away. After the Salah, Imam al-Mahdi disappeared. The Shia could no longer see him. The Ghaybah began, only the four ambassadors, they could access the Imam. So you want to access the Imam through the four ambassadors. This is the major view. The second view is no, it began before that. It began with the birth of the Imam. Some ulama believe the Imam was always in a state of Ghaybah. Remember we mentioned yesterday, Imam al-Mahdi, where was he those five years? during the life of Imam Askari, the first five years of his life, we said we have a hadith from the aunt of Imam Askari, Hakima, that Imam Askari gave him to the angels and they took him to the heavens. And he would come only once every 40 days or once every seven days. And it was not until a few months before Imam Askari died that he came and he went with his, with his grandmother to Hajj. So throughout those years, you could not see Imam al-Mahdi. Only it was once every, only a few people got to see him. He was in a small state of ghaybah. But most believe, no, the real ghaybah, the, the small ghaybah began with the death of Imam al-Askari. And it was for up to 70 years. It began the year 260, and it finished the year 329 uh, after the ghaybah. Now, what happened during ghaybah to sughra Why do we call it small ghaybah, big ghaybah? What's the difference? Now, like I said, during the small ghaybah, the imam appointed four representatives. There is a hadith that says, after the imam led the salah and his father, Imam Askari, there was a group of people that came from Qom and they brought hummus to give to Imam Askari. They, will, they were told Imam Askari is, is dead. They asked, who's the Khalifa? They said Ja'far. They went to Ja'far. They weren't convinced this is not the Khalifa. So they were about to go to Qom. All of a sudden, Imam al-Mahdi, he sent someone. He told them, come to me. They came to Imam al-Mahdi and they went into his house. They saw him, a young boy. They saw him and they... And they tested him, they saw this is the real Imam, he knows where, who this money belongs to and how much it is. They gave him the money. And then the Imam, he made an order. He told them, look, thank you for bringing this khumus and all this money, but from now on, I ask you, do not come to Samarra again. Do not bring any money to me because you, you can't see me and it's dangerous. So they said, what do we do with the khums then? The Imam told them, I will appoint a representative. And this is where the Imam appointed the first ambassador. And he told them, anytime you need anything from me, go to the first ambassador. He is my representative. 
He represents me in anything. So he told them from now on, go back to the first representative. And these four ambassadors, they're called Sufara, representatives, ambassadors. What did they do? They were basically the gateway of the Shia to Imam al-Mahdi. So what did they do? Four things. Number one, the first thing they did, they would answer the questions of the Shia. Sometimes the Shia, between the ulama of the Shia, there would be a disagreement. A group of ulama say this is wajib. A group of ulama says it's not wajib. A group of ulama say that Rasulullah did this. Another says no. So any debate they had, any disagreement they had, what did they do? They could not solve it. They used to go to the ambassador. They tell him, please ask the imam, what's the right answer? The ambassador would meet the imam and he then would bring the answer in a letter. It would be typed, it would be written with the handwriting of Imam al-Mahdi. And these letters were called what? At-Tawqi'at. Tawqi' and Tawqi'at. Anytime you hear the word Tawqi', this means a letter from Imam al-Mahdi. Imam al-Mahdi would issue, he would release a letter, give it to the ambassador, the ambassador would give it to him. And anytime they wanted to say a letter is released, they wouldn't say from Imam Mahdi. Remember, it was a time of taqiyya. The authorities were looking for Imam Mahdi. So they always had to what? They had to talk in a secretive way. So they would say, for example, خَرَجَ تَوْقِيعٌ مِنَ النَّاحِيَ A tawqi' A tawqi' meaning a letter has been issued, has been released from a nahiya al-muqaddasa. Nahiya al-muqaddasa means the sacred way, from that sacred way. And they mean by a nahiya al-muqaddasa, what? Imam al-Mahdi. This was what? A secretive kind of way to talk. So that the government does not understand who they are speaking about. So this was number one. And that's why we have many ahadith instances of the ulama. They had disagreements. They could go to the imam, to the ambassador. He would ask the imam. And then the tawqi' would come. This is the answer. This is number one. Number two, these ambassadors, they would collect any khumus or anything that's financial, anything monetary that belongs to the imam, and they would deliver it to the imam. That's number two. The third thing that these ambassadors would do is that they would solve the social and personal problems of the people. For example, someone wants a child. They want the imam to do dua for them. They would go to the ambassador. And that's why there's a hadith that says, the father of a sheikh al-Saduq that we mentioned, he... He wrote so many books, lived a thousand years ago, very, very big alim. The father of a Shaykh al-Saduq had no children. So what did he do? He went to the third ambassador. He lived during the time of Ghayb al -Sughra. He went and he told him, please ask Imam al-Mahdi to do dua for me because I want children. Sometimes when we have children, don't we go to the Imams right now? We go to Mashhad, Karbala, Anjaf, we ask the Imams. So this is what Shaykh al-Saduq did, the father of a Shaykh al-Saduq. His name was... Uh, his name was Muhammad Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Babu al Qummi, and he's buried in Qum. He told him, Ask the Imam to do dua for me. The Safir went, he came back with a letter, a tawqi'. The Imam is praying for him, he's telling him, Inshallah, I will pray for you. Allah will give you two sons that will be ulama. And subhanallah, a Shaykh al Saduq was born through the dua of Imam al Mahdi. What great honor is this? When Imam al Mahdi does dua for someone to have a child, you would expect that child to be someone great. And his brother likewise was also alim, but unfortunately because he did not write books, we don't know too much about him. And he's not always mentioned. So this is one incident how the father of a Shaykh al Saduq, he wanted dua to have children. Imam al Mahdi helped him, but through the ambassador. Another example, it's mentioned that a man had some problems with his wife. Just like many of us, we have problems with our wives. Many wives, they have problems with their husbands. So he went to one of the ambassadors of the imam and he began to complain against his wife. My wife is this, my wife is that, whatever. So please tell the imam to help me. The, the ambassador told the imam, a tawqi' came out. He told him, yes, inshallah, I will do dua for you and everything will get better. And subhanallah, the man says, everything became better. So this was another example. This is number three. Number four, a fourth thing Imam al-Mahdi would do through his ambassadors in Ghaybat al-Sughra, he would guide the Shia in difficult situations. Like what? If there was any danger surrounding the Shia from the enemies, from the governments, he would inform them. Let me give you an example. During Ghaybat al-Sughra, we said the government, they would always put spies to spy on the Shia. What are they doing? Who's their leader? So these spies, they understood and they found out that the Shia are giving their money to the ambassadors, to the wukala, and the wukala give it to the imam, or they give it to someone. They inform the government. The minister, the wazir of the, of the, of the uh, Bani al-Abbas, what did he say? He said, look, if we catch anyone giving a single dime, a cent, a dinar, dirham, to those wukala, then he will be arrested and killed. So, but he said, but let's make a plan, a very evil plan. 
let's disguise some of our spies as being Shia, as an innocent Shia. Let him go to that wakil and tell him, oh, wakil, I have some money, Khums, please, can you take it? And then once he takes it, right away he arrests him. So it was an evil plot. Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, he is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows the plot. They plan, Allah says, wa makaru wa makar Allah. They plan and Allah plans. So Imam al-Mahdi right away, he wrote a tawqiyah. He gave it to the safir, give it to all my wakala. All my wakala, right now, tell them from now on, you do not take any money from anyone. Stop. Until further notice. Why? He didn't say why. Remember, we have to submit to the Imam. When the Imam says something, of course, there's wisdom behind it. So the Shia right away, the wakala, they said, we will not collect any money. The spies went, they want to give money to the wakil. He says, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not wakil. So the, pl the plot and the agenda was foiled. They were not able to arrest any person until the, it finished, the whole incident finished. And then Imam al-Mahdi said, now you can collect. So this is one example of how the Imam used to guide his Shia during Ghaybat al sughra This is one thing the Imam would do, guide them in these difficult situations of the enemies. A second thing the Imam would do, if there were any imposters, who claimed to be ulama or any scholars that deviated and turned into heretics, the Imam would tell his Shia right away. He would curse that person and he would tell the Shia to stay away from him and to disavow him. Unfortunately, today we have so many people who claim to be ulama and they're not ulama. We don't have, unfortunately, someone to always tell us and to guide us who's the right alim, who's the wrong alim. Imam al Mahdi السلام, during the small ghaybah, he would do that. And that's why we have so many people. So many scholars, they were scholars that deviated the Imam right away. For example, al Shalmaghani. There was an alim by the name of Ibn Azaqir al Shalmaghani. He was a big alim. He had written books. His books were spread in the houses of the Shia. Until one day, Stajiru Billah. One day, this man, he began, began to deviate. He began to say so much nonsense that Ahlul Bayt are Allah, and that I don't know, Allah went into the body of Ahlul Bayt. So much nonsense. He began to deviate, but the Shia still, some of them are naive, they're gullible. Imam al-Mahdi right away, he what? He issues a tawqiyah against him, saying his name. This man is what? This man is saying kufr. This man is saying wrong things. Stay away from him. And this is when the Shia, they understood that this is wrong. They stay away. Many people, they what? They claim that they are safirs. We have only four safara. There's so many people, they claim they are safirs. Imam al-Mahdi right away, he would issue a tawqiyah. You'd imagine there was... A man by the name of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. We have, who's the leader of ISIS right now? Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, right? During Ghaybat al-Sughra, there was a man also by the name of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He was the nephew of the third Safir. We'll get to him in inshallah a few minutes. What did he claim? He claimed that I'm the fifth Safir. I'm the fifth ambassador. Right away, Imam al-Mahdi issues what? Tawqiyah, this man is a liar. He's an imposter. Do not follow him. We have one, a man by the name of al-Hallaj, al-Namiri. Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Bilal, and so on and so forth. All these people, they would either claim false things or they would be heretics. Imam al-Mahdi, he would right away uh, issue a tawqiyah against them. Another man by the name of Ali ibn, uh, Ahmad ibn Hilal. Ahmad ibn Hilal, he was a very good man. He was an alim, a narrator. But unfortunately, he also deviated. Imam al-Mahdi, three or four tawqiyat against him. He cursed him. Allahu Ahmad ibn Hilal. This is how severe the imam was because this is faith. You don't play with people's faith. So this was the second thing the Imam did. The, the Imam protected the school of thought of Ahl Bayt. Anyone that wanted to infiltrate, anyone wanted to play with people's religion, right away he would issue a tawqiyah and he would tell the people, this person is an imposter, a liar. And finally, number three, a third thing the Imam would do, anytime the Shia had to make a decisive, important decision, he would guide them. For example, there's two parties fighting in the government. Who do we side with? Because if we don't side, there's ramifications. If we side with this, there's ramifications. We have to what? We have to be wise. Imam Mahdi would help them. For example, there are certain times when we have to do taqiyya. Do we, do, do we stay silent? Do we speak? And all these decisive matters, the Imam, he used to what? He used to guide the Shia. But through the ambassador, it was through the tawqiyat, the letters of Imam al-Mahdi, Allah ta'ala, farajahu sharif And that's why you see Imam al-Mahdi, he appointed four ambassadors. And these four ambassadors, they weren't public ambassadors. Remember, we said if the authorities knew he's an ambassador of the Imam, first of all, which Imam? You're saying you have an Imam that's alive, let's go look for him. Second of all, they'll go and kill that person. So it was all secretive. Only the good, the trustworthy Shia knew this, this person is what? This person is a Safir of the Imam. Most of the Shia maybe they didn't know. Only the important trustworthy Shia. Or else if you go and see that person, he was just a normal man. The Sufara, the ambassadors, they were merchants. 
Some of them they used to sell butter. Some of them they used to sell, for example, vinegar. Others they used to sell cloth. They used to sell fabrics. And in their private gatherings, this is where they would tell the Shia, we are the ambassadors, and this is where they would take care of the matters of the Shia. And what you find is that these, why did Imam al-Mahdi, Ajjal Allah Farajah al-Sharif, choose these four out of everyone? So much Shia. Why did he choose these four? Now these four, they weren't ambassadors at the same time. When one would die, the second would come. So at, at one given time, there was only one ambassador. Why did the Imam choose these four during the 70 year period? Now what you find according to the ahadith, these four ambassadors had two important criteria. Number one, complete submission to Imam al-Mahdi. Never ask why. When the Imam tells them to do something, right away they do it. Right away, without hesitating, without asking, without quarreling and debating with the Imam, just like a slave at the hand of his master. The Imam says do this, they do it right away. This is number one, complete submission to Imam. Number two, their second criteria, the Imam chose them, is because they were loyal to the Imam. They were trustworthy, reliable. The Imam could entrust them with his secrets. He could tell them anything and he knows that they will what? They will safeguard these secrets. They, were con they kept everything confidential. They were wise. They knew who to speak to. They knew who to not speak to. Because what? This is a time of taqiyya. So based on these two criteria. Imam al-Mahdi, Ajjal Allah, Farajah al-Sharif, he chose these four sufara. Now we come to the final question. Who were the four sufara of Imam al-Mahdi? Before I begin, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Who were the four sufara of Imam al-Mahdi during al-Ghaybat al sughra The first of the four sufara of Imam al-Mahdi was a man by the name of Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri. Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri, he was a representative of Imam al-Hadi as well, of Imam al-Askari, and then of Imam al-Mahdi, Allah Farajah al-Sharif. And it's written in his biography that he began serving Imam al-Mahdi at what age? At the age of 11. So basically his whole life was for Ahl al-Bayt. His whole life, ever since he was 11, it was serving Ahl al-Bayt And we have many ahadith from Imam Hadi, and from Imam Askari, highly, highly praising, praising and speaking good of Uthman ibn Sa'id al-Amri. And that's why when, Uth when, Imam, when Imam Askari died, Imam Mahdi was the Imam, when Uthman ibn Sa'id, he claimed, I am the first ambassador of the Imam, no one doubted that because they knew this man, Imam Askari, uh, Imam Askari accepted him, Imam Hadi accepted him, he was already a representative of them. So obviously it's normal for him to be a representative of Imam Mahdi. So everyone accept, accepted him because he was so close to Imam Askari, so close to Imam Hadi. They knew that those previous Imams accepted him, they had praised him, they had told their Shia, listen to him. So now he all of a sudden he came and he tells the Shia, I am your first, I am the first ambassador of Imam al-Mahdi. You see it was a smooth transition. No one said you're lying. No, maybe it's someone else because he was so close to Imam Askari and Imam Hadi. This was the first ambassador. How many years did he serve? Five. From 260, when Imam Askari died, until 265. For five years, he was the ambassador and the gateway to Imam al-Mahdi. After he died, the second ambassador came. Who was the second ambassador? The second ambassador was his son, the son of Uthman ibn Sa'id. His name was Muhammad ibn Uthman al-Amri. Muhammad ibn Uthman al-Amri was the longest serving of them. He was the Safir of the Imam for 40 years. 40 years, he was the gateway to Imam al-Mahdi. Likewise, Muhammad ibn Uthman, highly praised by the Imams. By whom? Imam Askari. Many ahadith. The Imam Askari, he's speaking about Im Uthman ibn Muhammad ibn Uthman. And in one hadith, excuse me, in one hadith, Imam al-Askari alayhi salam, he told the Shia that Muhammad ibn Uthman, the first ambassador, he is my wakil. And his son, Muhammad ibn Uthman, is the wakil of my son, Al-Mahdi. So he made it clear. Muhammad ibn Uthman was appointed by Imam al-Askari. He told the Shia before even the Ghaybah began that amongst the wakala of my son, Al-Mahdi, will be Muhammad ibn Uthman al-Amri. And Muhammad ibn Uthman al-Amri, he was a very, very great alim. He was a very, very great personality of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam very trustworthy, very close to the Imam. Ahmed ibn Ahmed, Ali ibn Ahmed al-Dallal, he narrates the story. He says, one day I went to meet the second ambassador. 
Uthman, Muhammad ibn Uthman al-Amri. He said, I saw him, he is writing something on a piece of wood. Writing on a piece of wood. So I asked him, Ya Muhammad, what are you doing? What are you writing? He said, I'm writing some verses of the Quran apparently on this wood for my grave. Because when they, when they bury him, he, he, he needs this piece of wood in his grave. So he says, I am preparing this for my grave. And then he told me, do you see this hole over here? This is my grave. He told them every night, every night, this is while he's ambassador, I go into my grave and I read one chapter of the Quran in my grave. SubhanAllah. See how great this man is? You think they get this easily just because his father was the wakil, now I'm the wakil? Of course not. You see how great this man was? Every night he goes in his grave for how many years? Allah knows. He reads an entire chapter of the Quran in his grave. My dear brothers and sisters, how much Quran do we read throughout the year? Do we even touch the Quran or the piles and, and of dust just keeps on piling over it? At least I should read one page every single day. Be connected. There has to be a bond. Rasulullah says, Inni ta'arakum fikum One of them is Kitabullah. At least every day read one page of the Quran. If you can, two pages, five pages, one juz. that's excellent. But especially, if you don't read throughout the year, especially, especially, especially during the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan is called what? It's called, one of the names of Ramadan, Rabi'ul Qur'an. It's the spring of Qur'an, meaning this is when you read Qur'an. If you did not read Qur'an the entire year, this is when you start reading Qur'an. The hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he began before before uh, Ramadan came, he spoke about Ramadan. He told his Ashab about Ramadan. Amongst the things that he said about Ramadan, he said, whoever reads one verse of the Quran during Ramadan, Allah will give him the reward as if he read the entire Quran. Just say, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. The angel here will write, you read the Quran once, the whole Quran. Allahu samad, two Qurans. Lam yalid wa lam just read one verse, Allah will give you the thawab of reading the whole Qur'an. So basically there's extra credit, how much more? 6,666 times more, because that's how many verses in the Qur'an is. Read one verse, it's as if you read the whole Qur'an, 6,000 verses. SubhanAllah, how easy it is to what? To, to achieve reward, but unfortunately some of us we forget. So during the month of Ramadan, try to least read at least one juzu, 20 pages every day, so that you finish the Quran at least once. If you can twice, three times, some people I know they finish the Quran five times, seven times, ten times. A juzu takes an average person that can read Arabic 20 minutes. If you're a slow reader, 30 minutes. Let's say one hour, what's one hour? And remember there's no lunch, so that hour you used to use to eat lunch, use it to read Quran. So this, brothers and sisters, highlights the importance of reading the Qur'an. Now, some of us, unfortunately, we never read the Qur'an. Muhammad ibn Uthman, not only he read one juza every day, where did he read it? In his grave. Can you imagine what a type of effect that leaves on me? I go inside my grave so that I am reminded that, look, no matter how much wealth you have, no matter how long you're going to live, no matter what is in this world, this is my end. This is my true home. And it, this huge life of mine that I am so you know, happy about, it could go, all go away in one second. One split second, it could go away, and this will be my new home. So if I go in my grave, and obviously not every night, but if I try it once in a while, you will see that this will always remind you of death, remind you of Allah. When you want to sin, when you want to go away from Allah, you'll be reminded, wait, it's not worth it, because this is where I'm going. Every human being will go in and be placed in that grave. And this is my next home. So every night he would read one chapter of the Quran in the grave. They say one of our ulama by the name of Al-Mirza Mahdi Shirazi rahimahullah. Every Thursday or Wednesday, he used to study in Al-Najaf or Karbala. The students in the house, they would go swim. They would go spend some time on the weekend, either Wednesday night or Thursday over there the weekend. They would spend some time, you know, away from the house to relax. They say this young man, he would spend his night, the, you know, the weeknight, the, uh, the weekend, where everyone's having, uh, having you know, fun, enjoying themselves. This is how he spent his time. He used to go, he used to dig a grave, and he used to go inside that grave. And then he would speak him to himself. He would read this verse. Allah says in the Holy Quran, He says about every human being, when we are placed into the grave, what do we say? قَالَ رَبِّ رجعوني. 
What do we tell Allah when we are placed in the grave? Ya Allah, I beg you, please take me back even one hour so that I can pray one salah. I didn't pray enough. Because in the grave, I will see how important the a'mal are. The only thing that will benefit me in the grave is my a'mal. Salah, psalm, charity, doing good to other people. I tell Allah, Rabbi Rji'uni, take me one minute, one hour, one day, just so I could pray, do some, you know, give some charity, build some masjid, give for the cause of Allah, respect my parents, whatever. Read some Quran, dua. What does Allah say in the Holy Quran? Kalla. Kalla, no way. That's it, you had your chance. You're not going to have a chance. No one, no human being after dies, Allah is going to give him a chance to come back. Khalas, you have one chance, be careful. Do not waste your